Hello. Good evening, Mark. Can you hear me, Mark? <coughs> Can you just give me a thumbs up? You've got to show him on this one. If it's good. You are now. You're here. Twelve. <coughs> Sixteen. Hey, getting there. Twenty-two. Mark says he can hear us. Richard Shaw. Hey, <laughs> old <Yo>, Richard. <coughs> Lewis. Hey, uh, Lewis. <clears throat> Thirty. Just waiting for some more people to join. <coughs> Jeff Hills says good evening. Jeff who? Jeff Hills. Jeff Hills. Hello Jeff Hills, evening. Peter Kelsley's on. Yeah. How many we got on? 44. 44? Got to make a start then. <coughs> Angela says evening all. <coughs> evening Angela. Luke Ross is on. All right, guys and girls. Uh, tonight's lecture. Uh, we haven't got any questions from the the other day on Met, so presuming that you all took it on board and you all know it. Um, tonight's lecture, we're going to start just to mix it up a bit. Tonight we're going to do uh, start navigation, um, and then on Wednesday we're going to do air law, and I will do some on air law as well about anti uh, collision avoidance rules. Yeah, stop us from flying into each other. Um, and then on Friday we're back doing meteorology again. We're carrying with Met and we, we might look at a bit more specialised thermals, thermal development and things like that. <coughs> uh, so Mark's going to do the navigation. Now this applies to um, well it applies to everyone because this, this will teach you how to use an air map. Yeah, so when you're flying around, it doesn't matter if you're on your paraglider, your paramotor, in your microlight, or in your Cessna flying around, uh, it will teach you how to use an air map effectively so that you don't intrude in airspace. Yeah, um, so it is important, it doesn't matter what you fly. So, uh, Mark will take over. Are you ready to go, Mark? Yeah, yeah, yeah good to go. Yeah, how many have we got on? Uh, 80. We've got 80 on. Okay, great stuff. Let's make a start. Let's do some navigation. Now with this, Mark's going to hold pieces of paper up once again. Uh, if you have got an air map at home um, <coughs> or any of the anything related, go and grab your air map. Yeah, and it will help. If you haven't, don't worry about it. But it might help if you've got an air map. Alright, see you later guys. Hello and welcome back to um, Airways Air Sports. Just a, a big thank you from myself, Andy and Barry. We are on about 10,000 views so far, which is unbelievable. <laughs> about 9,900 or more than we were expecting. So we really do appreciate and we love all your feedback and your comments. Uh, we spend a lot of time obviously messaging you guys. Um, personally, either myself or Andy will reply back to you as well. So, if you have anything specific for myself or for Andy, uh, please do message us. It obviously helps pass the time away. Obviously, we lost one more hour of uh, isolation uh, on Sunday, so I hope you all adjusted your clocks if you are in uh, in Britain. So, right on to British summer time. Okay, so what I wanted to do is move on and just shake things up just a little bit, and rather just talking about Met, which is a huge subject. Um, in itself, we thought we'd um, change topics and just try and hit the basics of navigation. Now, navigation itself, obviously, just like Matt, is one of those few subjects that actually people want to learn about. You know, we hear more and more 
uh, from students. What if you get lost? That seems to be the, the biggest fear about leaving the airfield or, or venturing to somewhere new. And we will come on to things like loss procedure. Obviously the, uh, the golden rule is there are those pilots um, that have uh, been lost and they're all liars. Uh, it's, it's quite simple. We've all been temporarily unaware of our location at some point in our flying careers and it will happen to you if it hasn't happened uh, yet but at some point you have that where am I moment. So my idea with these navigation uh, lectures uh, or lessons more to the point is to try and prevent the where am I from happening in the first place. And again, just like meteorology, um, navigation is something that you spend a lot of time learning when you're in the classroom and certainly when you're learning to fly. And then it's quite a steep slope. We start using more and more technology. We start using less and less the basics of navigation. Um, and that's normally when it, it tends to, uh, to go south uh, and we find ourselves in one of those memorable moments that we have to pull something out of the bag and sort it out. So we're going to take it right back to basics again and try and progress. Obviously this is something that I would normally do in a classroom situation of 15-20 people um, and navigation is all about practice. Uh, use it or lose it is another great uh, phrase to be used and navigation is very much uh, that um, personified. So we need to look at navigation um, on how we use it because there's a lot of navigation. Do we do the same things in the classroom as we do in the air, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So the, uh, the thing to bear in mind is there is a significant difference between flight planning and navigation. The flight planning that you do is everything you do the night before a flight or the morning before a flight, everything that you can do before you get in your aircraft and fly away, the better. Now, it can be a case of too much information, and certainly now, uh, the, uh, when I look at some of the old routes that I did when I, when I first qualified, to the routes that I do now, the information is quite significantly less. But again, I'm, I'm not trying to mark every single thing on a map. When you start using a map regularly, you become aware that certain things are there. You become aware of your stepping stones, those obvious visual reference points. Um, and if you can find yourself to one of those VRPs, you can find yourself to the next one. We normally get hissed and booed at because it's called feature crawling. Uh, but feature crawling can be quite a very useful way of getting from one place to another. Um, okay, so. What I want to do is, first of all, bring in some equipment, because equipment is very, very important. Now, the equipment that you use is aviation specialised. Um, there are protractors that you can get and there are rulers that you can get, but we need specifically aviation navigation equipment. And that doesn't mean so they can charge you an extra two or three pounds. It's because it's actually quite useful. So I just want to go through some of those things. Um, first of all, obviously, we have a basic flight protractor. Now, if I put my hand behind her, can you see this? Can you see that, Barry? Yeah. Now, yes, it looks like a normal protractor. First of all, it's square. Now, that makes life a lot easier because we can use these straight lines in order to draw lines on a map. But if you notice even closer, you'll see there is not just black writing, but there's blue writing. And that's the reciprocal heading. Very, very useful in aviation. And also you'll see that this protractor is broken up into grid forms. These are uh, parallel to the north, south and east and west lines as well. So when you're trying to pick up a line of longitude or latitude, you can use those quite useful uh, as well. So not just a protractor, an aviation protractor. The other thing that we will definitely, definitely use, and I have three or four of these of different <laughs> sizes, is a scale rule. Now if I show you this side, you can see that one scale is in uh, half mil scale and the other one is in quarter mil scale. Again, relevant to the type of map that you're using, but a very useful piece of kit when you're using a, uh, a map that's obviously marked in nautical miles. Now, another thing that you will definitely, definitely need is pens. Now, I use these ones which are fine on one side 
and a medium nib on the other side just because I come from a flex swing background and when everything around you is vibrating a thicker line here is quite useful and again depending on uh, who you uh, sit down and do navigation with they will indicate or hint to you which colour to use some people mark the track lines in red some people mark them in black some people I think most people mark wind in green and some people use varying colours but it's useful to, for you to have your colour code so that you can relate that when you're looking at the map as a quick glance you know that red means and green means and black means so it's, it's useful to have some colour pens uh, obviously the obligatory rubber um, I wouldn't use this particularly for re uh, removing huge uh, a, um, markings on the map the best thing to use to remove those is a dry white marker try it trust me or nail polish remover but there's a lot of explaining to do when the missus nail polish remover goes missing um, okay now at some point you will also need a map now we'll come on to the differences on maps but ultimately in the basic terms for aviation there are two maps for us to use and the first one is a map like this which is the southern uh, half mil, we use that because of where we are located but this is a half million map and we'll come on to the difference between the maps um, at, a, at another time and there is also the quarter million map now obviously there is quite a difference in scale therefore the uh, information that's on the quarter mil and the half mil although it's similar there will still be a town in the same place one is depicted better uh, and another one is depicted with a blob and that blob might mean a certain uh, amount of people in, in a given area but ultimately things like airspace and roads and rails only on the quarter mil but certainly navigational aids are marked on those maps we will come back and talk more uh, in detail about maps uh, later now once you progress and you've gone past sort of the basics um, of uh, navigation and certainly may have done your first qualifying cross country you might look at using some more advanced equipment one of the most advanced equipments that we use is something like this which is a flight computer now I got all excited when someone mentioned flight computer because I thought yeah, I could just sit there with an app or a web app um, and it would do it all for me but no these things really are what they used to use back in the uh, in the World War II days uh, and before um, and these things really are a work of art it's absolutely amazing the information that you can take from one of these things like pressure density you can work out your triangle velocities endless there are endless things that are on here the downside is again use it or lose it I learned to use one, uh, one of these in order to get me through my PPL exams. Halfway through my PPL exams I ended up throwing it away because I was spending more time trying to work out how to use one of these. Apparently hand sanitizer works well for the cleaning mats so at the end of all of this we hope to have yes. some left. As if only there wasn't a shortage in hand, san hand sanitizer enough. Um, okay, other things that are really really useful and it, again it depends on what type of aircraft or, or flying machine that you're using but some form of kneeboard I know people make their own but there are endless amounts um, uh, available to you so this is a micro light kneeboard and you'll see that there is a lot of information that's already printed on there certainly things like VFR uh, is it normally Morse code that's on this one? oh no Morse code on this one but lots of information that's quite useful for you should you forget to write it down I personally use a larger kneeboard this one is a trifold, and I use this because I can get varying bits of information and I can tuck things like ch checklists um, and listening score codes and things like that in there. Another thing that's useful is one of these VFR flight guides, or all flight charts, sorry. Very useful because they've done a lot of boxes uh, uh, that asks information that you might not think is important, but it actually is very useful when you need it. Uh, and so they, I think they're like two or three pounds to be honest for, for quite a thick uh, leaf of, uh, of information. You can also do your own, I did that for years. Uh, a very good friend of mine uh, had a fantastic super duper planning sheet as it was uh, greatly titled 
and you know it was an Excel sheet you typed it in you can put formulas in there so as long as you're writing down information and you aren't just writing it on the back of a uh, scrap piece of paper as if not to heed my own advice this is one that I did in 2018 so I'm unsure where that was from so there we go there's some basic bits of kit that you will definitely need now there is also obviously we're in a world where technology is taking over now a while ago it used to be very very prominent that everyone used to fly with things like airbox or GPS uh, and this was mine 10 years ago and this was a very useful piece of kit just a simple Garmin you typed in the Latin long of where it is that you wanted to go to and it was a very much a point and shoot you could work your ground speed out of it and all sorts of things and it was very useful um, obviously as things developed you had things that would tell you about airspace which is very useful as well obviously these are becoming less and less uh, um, prominent less and less usable because basically technology has has advanced somewhat um, and so you have programs like Sky Demon, NRF Pro to name but a few where there is so much information there it does live tracking, it does all your flight calculations and your planning it will tell you where you are, it, it will warn you of no TAMs um, Sky Demon obviously a, a, a recognisable source for no TAM information the downside with those things is that they turn off have you ever fallen out with the sat nav in your car I know it's pretty much most times I play the sat nav game you know the sat nav saying telling me to do one thing but as uh, is very much the case more and more people are becoming reliant on these apps and this software and they turn off they don't pick up a GPS signal they freeze in flight and I have a number of stories where this has happened to me personally so I'm not for one minute saying oh, don't use Sky Demon don't use AirNav Pro or, or any of the other flight tracking software that's out there they are very very good and I would choose to have one in the cockpit with me than not it, I, there's one in every plane that we use and I use both AirNav Pro and Sky Demon uh, both very good um, but the issue is becoming the case that that's now becoming the primary source of navigation and the issue being is when you're using an iPad or anything like that as your primary source of information you're flying like this you're staring at your iPad kneeboard your, uh, whatever it is that you're displaying it on and you're not looking out the window now we learn to fly for a reason it, and the view was one of those to be looking out of the window and looking for the next visual reference point to be looking for that hill out in the distance is much better you have now picked up one point of reference and another point of reference you can use your flight planning software as the third therefore triangulating so we know where we are when we do things like life checks you know, for L location or Frida you know we are looking at where are we specifically so don't just be reliant on your uh, flight software <clears throat> it may turn off it probably will turn off <clears throat> excuse me and another thing that I found that was very useful was the uh, radio telephony course and that just opened up new uh, new horizons I could fly in airspace that I couldn't previously fly in uh, even just listening in and, and hearing information that's going on in the area that I was I found it as a, a very very useful um, aid to my navigation and also should something go wrong you can maybe mention that you're temporarily unaware of your location and they may be very kind and give you a vector to somewhere that you may know okay so let's start um, looking at navigation um, on a whole and again really this is aimed more at um, sort of a intermediate beginner student uh, certainly someone who may be of have just qualified very useful if you're about to take a nav exam because one of the things that you get given in your uh, meteorology exam is two airfields and maybe a waypoint and these are probably going to be airfields that you have no idea where they are unless you're very lucky and you happen to be based at one of the one of the uh, exam uh, uh, airfields 
And so they will give you the name of the airfield, which is fantastic. And the first thing that everybody starts to do is this. Scouring the map in the hopes of finding an airfield. You're just wasting time. They will also give you a lat and long uh, figures. Latitude and longitude figures are a much easier way of finding something um, on a map uh, than just scouring it over it all. So what is latitude uh, and longitude? So we need to be talking really about the formation of the Earth. So here is our, again, no, fl no flat wheel believers. If you're a flat wheel believer, please feel free to uh, press that stop button. This is really going to upset some of your thoughts. So in all sense and purposes, the world is round. <coughs> Let me see that, okay? And this makes a problem for navigation because there is no start point, there is no end point. It will always come back around. And so, back in the 1600s, 1500s, 1600s, when we wanted to sail across great big oceans and meet up with our friends and go and make friends with cannonballs to other people that we'd never met before, we needed to find a way of being able to pinpoint with accuracy that specific spot um, on the actual planet. And this again was the cause of many great wars because the first thing that was actually quite easy was to work out the first line. And that's known as the equator. It was very, very simple. This was the point that was there. But we also knew where north was and we also knew where south was because we had already discovered compasses by those obviously. So we were able to work out then, using this as a center point, that if we mark this up from the center of the Earth, we knew that there was zero degrees, and there was 90 degrees, and vice versa, coming the way down to south, 90 degrees. So this was really, really simple. You were either north of the equator, or you were south of the equator. Very, very simple. And so we would therefore have 30 degrees north, 60 degrees north, not quite as accurate as I want to be. Um, I have put an 80 in there, 80 degrees north. You could therefore easily work out a circumference, and obviously these went all the way around the planet. Easy. Now this is where the next issue became about, because there was no obvious starting point when we were coming long ways um, around the planet. And so again, there were 1.3, I think three zero lines of longitude, the meridian line. Um, and then it got narrowed down to two, obviously as varying countries won the war on this one. And I still think to this day there are two. So our zero meridian line, our line of longitude passes through Greenwich. Um, it's an easy one. There is also the Paris Meridian Line, which is about three or four degrees off from what we use. And again, depending which country you are. But normally in the most, most of the world we use Greenwich as the zero meridian line. And therefore it was easy to work out that if we went all the way around the planet, that this zero meridian line would be zero degrees, and all of the other lines of longitude would come around it all the way around to the other side where we would be at 180 degrees. Now of course when we go past 180 degrees we start getting closer uh, than we do further away and so if we were going this way it would be west and if we were going that way it would be east. So it was very easy therefore to work out a uh, latitude and longitude um, figure for us to work out a dot on the planet. <clears throat> Easy. The downside is we also therefore wanted more and more accuracy. So this is where these whole lines of latitude and longitude got broke down into further and further <coughs> measurements. Get this up so I can see. And so, as much as 
North and south were broken down into 0 to 90, and east and west was broken down into 0 to 180. Each whole degree was broken down into 1 to 60 minutes. And so therefore we could break down a lot easier and narrow us down to an even smaller margin. But of course as accuracy increased, we wanted to break that down even further. And so for these minutes were therefore broken down into seconds. <clears throat> now there's also an argument there that went on, well we don't use seconds, we use decimals. And so depending on which format you use, this can also be broken down into seconds of 0, 1 to 99. Uh, and again, that will be uh, depending on uh, which particular information you're being given. So just as a scenario, Darley Moor, which is our home airfield, can be written in a number of ways. So we always get given the uh, north or south first. So we always get north or south first uh, and so it can be written north 52 58 12 and then west 0, 0, 1 44 54 So that is a typical latitude and longitude um, information that's given us for our specific airfield and this is 52 degrees north 58 minutes north and 12 seconds north so this would be breaking down further and further into that to give us that pinpoint on the map we can then also see that this is west so we know that it's this side of the line west 001 44 minutes and 54 seconds Again, so that will narrow us down to a really, really fine uh, pinpoint of accuracy within, within metres. You could also write this figure down in a, a number of other ways. It might just be given in north 52, 58.20, and west 001, 44.90. So exactly the same figure, just one is in seconds and the other one is in decimals. So it depends how it is shown on the, uh, uh, on the information that you'll be given uh, on whether it is a decimal or whether it is in seconds. Now, in aviation, to be honest, it's a little bit more inf information that we actually need. So we are more likely to get Darley Moore depicted very, very simply, north 52, for fifth, north, here we go, 58, west 002, 45. So that is more likely what we get to given in, uh, in terms of Latin longitude, because we don't need the level of accuracy of going into seconds. Uh, or certainly uh, into decimals. And now they can sometimes write and put the north at the other end and the west at the other end. But key things to remember is that your north or south figure will only ever be a two digit number because it can only go up to 90. Whereas your west or east digit will always be a three digit figure because it can go up to 180. And so even though this one is two, it's written as zero, zero, two just to avoid any confusion uh, whatsoever. So what sort of scale are we looking at? So, in terms of distance, and bear with me, we'll come on to this in a moment, but in terms of distance, one whole degree is an equal to 60 nautical miles. And one minute is equal to one nautical mile. This is where it kind of changes a little bit because one second is equal to 101 feet. Um, one decimal is equal to 61 feet. So just as terms of scale we can see on, depending on the level of accuracy, do we want to be within 100 feet 
uh, of where we're going or just within one nautical mile. We hope we would have been able to find an airfield when we are within one nautical mile of it. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's uh, um, latitude um, and longitude. Normally at this point is where I would then spend half an hour uh, working with my class on finding varying airfields. Uh, and so a good way for you guys to practice is with a half mil map or a north uh, mil map. I'd recommend using the southern half mil map because that's normally what the exams are on. Uh, and just practice finding airfields or find the airfield and write down its latitude and longitude. Uh, and it's a lot harder than you think. Now, what I'm going to do is give you a quick helping hand here. And the easiest way is to look out into the ocean on these. Because you'll see, let me see that there, Barry. <coughs> oh, good. We can see here this is 53 degrees north. And you can see that this one has got a scale on it. And there is 5 degrees west, and that one has got a scale on it. But this one here is just a flat line. All on an aviation map, all whole degrees are scaled. Whereas half degrees, so 30 minutes, are always just a flat line. And so if you're looking for 54, 53 degrees north, you can find it there. If it was 53 degrees north and 31 minutes, you would come up to the next whole line. Now again, the scale that they use is written on the map quite easily. We'll stick it over here. And on all lines of whole degrees, first of all, you'll see uh, the next line, I'll say that's there. You'll get one, two, three, four, five. And you'll see that the fifth one is a slightly larger line. And then it will go up another five, two, three, four, and you will have a double larger line. So all of these smaller lines, can you see that okay there? I've stubbed my pens really hard so that you can see. So all of these short half, uh, or larger half lines are 5 minutes and all of the double larger lines are 10 minutes. Now I've left this on the board because these measurements obviously are only accurate on whole lines. So lines of longitude where they don't change um, in, in shape, they are all the same size. They are the only ones that are actually 60 nautical miles between um, each whole degree. And the reason being, that you can see here, that the lines merge towards the pole to give us our true north. So the distance between here and here is different than the distance between here and here. And that's because the lines converge towards the poles, very, very simple. Um, and a good way, if you don't believe me, is even very easily on a uh, half mil map, is measure uh, with a scale rule the lines of longitude at the bottom and compare it to the distance um, at the top. It's quite a significant difference, even over the, uh, the scale um, that we're using. Uh, you know, never mind on a planetary scale that we have over here. So yes, lines of longitude and latitude. And if you're trying to find, we're going to show you our particular area. We have quite a lot of airspace. You can see here, trying to find a whole degree or any form of scale, um, actually midland is quite difficult. So it might be easier for you to go out to the sea, find the whole degree and then move in. My other top tip to you would to be use a piece of paper. So bear with me. And so remember that everything that you're given will be north of or south of or west of or east of. Make sure you're going in the right direction. So in our scenario we were using north 52. So I'm looking out to the sea, there's north 52. And I will place a piece of paper on the north 52 line. I can then count up using the scale, knowing that the airfield is going to be above the piece of paper. And again, leave that piece of paper in play, and then work west off, find the whole degree, and then count it over. That way, when you're two pieces of paper in, the airfield you're looking for, or area you're looking for, will be right in the corner. So it's a, uh, a nice little way of finding um, information, uh, or places 
And if anyone's got any tips on folding maps, the easiest way to fold a map. Okay, so there's other things that we need to bring into, uh, into play as well, and these are things like great circles, uh, rum lines, uh, and all of these keywords that you will hear. Now, a great circle is very, very simple. This is a straight line that's drawn on a map. Now, we draw it on a map, but of course, the issue we have is that the planet is a sphere. It is round. So, although the line on our map is straight, the line that we would fly would be curved. And so for every time we cross one of these lines of longitude, it will be at a different angle. So let's say that this one is uh, 45 degrees, this one might be 46 degrees, and this one might be 47 degrees. And so to avoid any, any uh, misreadings, not being able to, to get the right heading because obviously if I take a bearing at the, de at the departure point obviously the difference from what it's going to be at the destination is going to be quite significant and so the easiest place to always take your bearing from is the centre of track and this will balance out. Now don't get me wrong the sort of distances that we're going to be travelling we hopefully will not just sit there staring at a compass heading um, and blindly miss the airfield by three degrees. But certainly the further you go uh, and the longer distance you go in, it does need to be factored. And these are called great circles. Now great circles are any path that if we continued that circle all the way around would come back uh, to where we started from and if we were to slice through the planet uh, 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 through that, it would go through the centre of the Earth. All lines of longitude are great circles. They are always going to pass through the centre of the Earth. Whereas lines of latitude don't pass through the centre of the Earth. If we were to take a, a, a slice of the planet through a line of, uh, uh, of latitude, obviously there would be slightly different layers. These are referred to as small circles. Now, the other thing that we use, and it depends on the map or the chart that we're using, we can also draw a rum line. Now, a rum line, again, this is, say we were using a half mil map, which is uh, a slightly different um, maps, not map scale, but map projection. Uh, on a quarter mil map, the lines of longitude don't converge. They are straight. So if we were to draw a map, a line through a map, it would pass through every line of longitude at the same angle. Now the issue being on this is in reverse, that in reality the line that we've drawn um, on our map would be straight, uh, would be curved, sorry, would be curved. So we would, again, go and fly a slightly different route. Please don't worry about it too much, and if you do ever find yourself sitting in a plane going, Am I flying a rum line or a great circle? I'm unsure. Okay. So, again, this is a point where we would sit and practice drawing lines on a map where I would get you finding some airfields. The more map work that you can do in your own time, and certainly in the classroom or with an instructor, uh, the better. You know, it, it very much is a case of practicing um, what you intend to use. Okay. So what I need to do now is come back into um, our planet. We've talked about uh, lines of latitude and longitude. And what this is doing is this is bringing up for us our very first north. How many norths do you think that we have in aviation to worry about? That's right, three. <laughs> so we have true north. This is a man-made uh, north. This is something that is always fixed uh, because lines of longitude will always converge at the poles. Uh, the world moves around it. The lines stay where they are. It's a man-made thing uh, referred to as true north. Now we also have magnetic north. Now magnetic north is constantly on the move and it's actually on its way back. I don't know if you've read varying articles where they're expecting that North and South Pole um, are due to switch, uh, maybe not in our lifetime, 
but you can see I've marked on this map here when magnetic north currently is. Can you see that there? And what's happening is it's like a spinning top. Obviously the planet is, is rotating and we are rotating around the sun um, and it's moving around. Now it takes time but this currently has worked its way down and about the 1930s switched and started coming back up. Now the issue that where people are saying north and south are going to switch is it's coming back up a lot quicker than it went down. So they are estimating that it's going to have momentum and come over, uh, over to one side. Um, and so yeah, that's uh, magnetic north. We also have compass north. Now compass north very much depends on what aircraft you're flying. Some aircraft have no issues with uh, deviation. Um, and some aircraft are just huge massive magnets and so we need to as pilots be able to factor in these three norths to ensure that we are traveling in the right direction in the first place obviously all the calculations that we've done all the flight planning that we're doing is based on true north all the wind information that we're being given is based on true north and now we go and jump into the cockpit. So again, as part of our flight planning, we need to factor in things like variation and deviation. So variation is very, very simple. Variation shows the difference between magnetic north and true north. Um, and again, as with most things in aviation, it's not a secret. Here's me now wishing I didn't throw this on the, on the floor. Now, magnetic variation is marked on a map, and again, it's much easier to find symbols when you look out to the sea. Magnetic variation is marked with these blue lines that are dotted lines down there. Can you see those? And they're called lines of isognals. And where they meet the corners of the map, you'll see a figure written there. Now on this map, it's written in blue so that you don't confuse it with the lines of whole degrees. And so this is a line of isognal. Now if I draw these on the map, they will be lines of equal magnetic variation to do with your specific point on the Earth. And it depends year on year. They change very regularly. This is one of the reasons why the half mil map is changed every year is because the magnetic variation changes so significantly. So we need to be able to work out quite quickly um, the difference between true and magnetic uh, north so that we can factor that in. So, you will normally get a figure, and I'll use the one that we've got here. So the figure that we've got here is west 0 0.5. Very, very simple. Now, the easiest way to remember this is, and I can hear you all saying it through the camera, west is best. So if it says east, it means that east is least. And it doesn't mean that we need to head more west or east. If west is best, we would add that. East is least, we would subtract that. So let's just keep this really, really simple. Um, we'll change the variation to make it make it uh, more relevant. So let's say that west is two degrees, and let's say we were going east, it would be uh, two degrees. Again, it it depends what it says on the map. You see here it says 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Further over this way, it should be, there we go, 
And that's just on from one end of the southern half mill to the other end of the southern half mill. And so if we were looking to take a heading of 090, heading east, and we were heading towards one of these lines of isogonals, which happens to be 2 degrees, we would add 2, so our magnetic heading would be 092. Very, very simple. West is best, east is least. If it was the other way around, obviously we would not uh, uh, add it, we would subtract it, so east is least, and therefore our heading would be 088. West is best, east is least. Now, variation is one thing, and like I say, look into the ocean and you will see those lines of isogonals, and if you couldn't see on the map, they are blue lines that are quite close together, and at the corners is written the figure of whatever that variation might be. The other thing that we need to factor in, obviously, is deviation. And deviation is something that will either come with your aircraft, uh, a deviation card, and it might look something like this. So that's a typical deviation card. It certainly might come with your compass if you were to buy a uh, uh, operate your compass um, and a deviation like I say is very specific to your aircraft and it's all to do with the magnetic output that your aircraft is producing obviously engines uh, batteries GPS's uh, watches iPhones Everything is giving out some form uh, of electrical magnetic radiation. It will affect your compass, like putting a magnet next to your compass. We don't know any instructors that would ever do that. Uh, it will affect your compass, so we need to factor this in. And so, if this was our aircraft, there we go, that's the noise of it. As we start to turn around and change directions, the compass will try to be pulled back towards north, or if we point it in this direction, the compass will try to be drawn back. And so a typical deviation, a deviation card in your aircraft would say north, 30, 60, east, and so on and so forth. Now, north might be very significant, there is no deviation. 30 degrees there might be uh, a little bit of deviation, and it might say east 1. Uh, 60 degrees, uh, let's say it's more, so it will be east 4. And if we were flying east, uh, let's say east 6. There we go. So, and so on and so forth through, uh, through the entire of your, devi uh, your deviation card. And just like variation, the mnemonic is very, very simple. Deviation west uh, is best, so we would add that. So deviation east is least, we would take it away. So in this scenario, if we were trying to fly a heading of 3-0, we would take away 1, so we would fly a heading of 2-9, or 0-2-9. If we were trying to fly a heading of 0-6-0, we would have to fly 0-5-6 and so on and so forth. And so it's very, very simple to work out the deviation of your aircraft and it requires two people and I would recommend you do this uh, whenever you're uh, adding something of significant difference to your aircraft. Go park yourself in the middle of the airfield, probably not on the, on the actual runway, that would be annoying, but find a nice spot where there's nothing around. Turn everything on and you would point your aircraft's compass to north, and you would have someone outside, far enough away that you weren't affected, with their compass uh, pointing towards you. They would then mark the difference between what you were pointing and what they are reading. And you would do that for the significant points all the way around. Now a good way of practicing this, particularly if you have an exam coming up, and certainly worth factoring in, is that you would have these um, as some form of um, memorandum, some, something to actually remind you to do this. So you would your, have your uh, not magnetic, 
Uh, sorry, we have true compass. So I'll, I'll get this right one of these days. True magnetic and compass. Our three norths that we have there. And so we would write in what we wanted to do. So we would want to fly 090. We would have a our variation, which west is best, we would add that on, so near 091, and then we would have our deviation, which in this scenario we said was east 6. So we would take that away. So therefore 0 8. Five. So on a very simple scale, we want to fly 090. In order to do that, we need to fly a compass heading of 085. Now this is, again, you want to do these as practice till it's something that you don't get wrong. You don't want to sit there going, right, what was it? What did Mark say? What was my instructor saying before about deviate? Oh, it'll be all right. Because actually, five degrees can be quite a significant difference between you getting to where you want it to be and having that I don't recognize anything the stuff over here and it's it's the same whether you're flying a Cessna whether you're flying a C42 or a Sky Ranger a flex wing a paramotor a paraglider everything is giving out uh, a magnetic field so it's important that you discover if your aircraft or flying machine is being uh, affected and in what way. Okay, now what I also want you to do um, as a bit of revision before we come on back and do uh, navigation for the next time is get hold of an aviation map and it doesn't matter whether it's current or not um, but the more you look at these maps the better. Now surprisingly it's not a big secret they don't it's not a competition on who can remember the most symbols um, they make it very clear for you. They get all of this information out there for you to use. So here is a southern half mil. And if anyone, so shout out to anyone, if anyone has got any edition 42 uh, southern half mils, I definitely will take all of those off you. And you can see that we have the entirety of the map here. But we'll also see that we have a number of sections where there is no map. They're about two metres apart. And so you'll see down on this side here is all of the aerodrome information that you'll need. So all the names are of the airfields are written down. And next to it is the air uh, radio frequencies that they are currently using. You'll also see this little symbol here, which will tell you the information about an ATZ, an air traffic zone. So everything you need to know about airfields is here. And again, this small writing there, worth a good read. The next box that we have is down here. And this box is to do with airspace. So danger zones, uh, all the classifications of airspace, anything there, all to do with um, um, en-route flying. Now down there, my lovely assistant will also be showing you, there is a third legend, a third box. That relates to everything topography wise. So you can see um, here, this is white and this is brown. Now it doesn't take us too, too much to work out that actually that it means hills, but at what height? So you can see there, there is a scale and white to dark brown means a difference in altitude. Things like this are actually quite important, particularly when we relate this to nav, when we knew what cloud base was, we certainly wouldn't want to go and take a route uh, through a hilly area. Um, fortunately, they also do write spot heights on there as well, but again, we'll come back and do more, um, more specific map work uh, in time. But you'll also see there are things that are marked on there like roads, uh, railways, uh, rivers, towns, you'll see there's an area where there are all different colours of yellow and different shapes and sizes. This is what I was saying before about a circle denotes a certain population whereas a square denotes another population. This is certainly useful. When I'm flying on route, and this is where we are, and when we regularly fly down 
uh, uh, down this side. I have no idea what Dursley looks like. I know what Cheadle looks like, because it's next to us. So I don't need to know an accurate depiction of what it looks like, just that there is a settlement coming up. I don't even know, need to know the name particularly. Useful if I'm lost, useful if I'm reporting where I am, but again, I don't need to know accurately what it looks like, just that there is a large settlement over there. So spend time looking at maps. Spend time looking at your local area, particularly if you're planning. Don't just use Sky Demon, Air Nav Pro, uh, and all the other flight software that's there. Use your map. Everything on there that you need to know. And trust me, from putting this into practice, it's a much better flight when your head is up, looking for that town with two railway, two railway lines going through it, as opposed to going, oh, I'm just a little bit off that magenta line, bring myself back. It's much better flying. Now again, maps, navigation equipment, thank you Andy, uh, they do cost money. This is my original protractor that I bought off Captain John Bradders 11 years ago. Uh, I've still got it, still cherish it, it's a little bit broken, but I've still got it. Uh, pens, they run out, you use them. I tend to have to buy a set every year because a student borrows them and then they never come back. Buy them from your schools, buy them from your clubs. You can get them 50p, five pounds, whatever, slightly cheaper, maybe on the internet. But I don't think with the, today's current climate, we could uh, drive that home anymore. Your flying schools, your clubs, every penny counts. So buy your equipment off your flying school. Uh, it's only 50p to you, uh, or five pounds, but support your clubs, support your schools. We certainly will be changing the way we think and the way that we plan to support in our local uh, surrounding areas. Anyway, so that's about it for me on navigation for the first one. A very basic sort of introduction on navigation. I hope it's uh, been of some use to you. Practice. It's the only way of learning how to do navigation. Learning how to find latitude and longitude. Um, a student of mine, it took him 45 minutes just to find the airfields. And this was someone who knew Latin longitude. That's not even a question on the exam. It tells you where the airfields are. So don't fall into the, the usual trick of going, yeah, know that, practice it. Uh, and there's a number of ways that you can. And that's really the way that I'm going to be doing future navigation exams. It's not just showing you on how we do it, but also on how you can practice at home. These videos are great and you can watch them back. Certainly all of our other uh, videos you can watch on our Facebook channel as well. We really appreciate your comments. But that's it for me. Uh, we should be back on Wednesday with some air law. I'm going to hand you back over to Andy, who's been the other side of the camera, been reading your comments uh, and input. And I hope you've enjoyed the session, and we'll see you Wednesday. A <clears throat> um, couple of questions came through, or one question came through. How do I read this yeah, when I'm flying my paramotor? Yeah, obviously it's flapping in the wind, very difficult to read it. That is all part of planning. If, if you're taking off from Darley Moor, um, plan your route first. So with a paramotor, we're not flying very far. <clears throat> yeah, we're most cross countries, a couple of hours. Yeah, you should be able to plan and use visual reference points. So if you were taking off at Darley Moor, know the airspace above you, yeah? know the airspace en route so that you don't break that airspace. So plan to fly at a height, use some discipline, plan to fly at a height, and then get in your mind your visual reference points. So if we were flying north from here, I would have Ashbourne, I would have Carsington Water, I would have Matlock, yeah, so I know my visual reference points and then when I turn around I can use those visual reference points on the way back and know how high you can fly above your takeoff so that you don't break airspace. That's, it's very simple with power motors. You know, we, we're not using uh, deviations and you know, it's, they're short cross countries really so just know your 
airspace and know your visual reference points that you're going to use en route and use them. Somebody says IFR, I follow roads, I follow rivers, I follow railways. Correct. Yeah. The warning there is if you follow a major road, so south of us is the A50, yeah, between uh, we've got Derby down the road and towards Stoke is a great visual reference point to fly down. The problem with that is everybody follows it, so you must have your eyes peeled. If you're going to follow a major road, yeah, don't forget everyone else is doing the same. So yeah, abide by the rules. Yeah, be very careful when you're doing that. That's all I would say on that. Okay, so we are back on Wednesday with some air law. Um, hope, you, hope you've enjoyed this session and uh, look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday. All right, from then, stay safe, stay well, and stay at home. <laughs>